When the Empire of Austria-Hungary declared a military offensive against Serbia on July 28, 1914, the world braced itself for a war on a scale that was unprecedented for its time. Not only did the First World War redefine the scale of warfare, but also how deadly, dangerous, and devastating it could be. Machine guns down rows after rows of soldiers. Mines made every step on the battlefield feel like living a thousand deaths, and life in trenches was hell on earth. The stakes had never been higher, and the odds were heavily stacked against soldiers on both sides. I'm talking about odds like George Santos finishing his term, those kinds of odds. Wars often demand sacrifices, and during the First World War, many men of valor had to undertake perilous duties in order to save the lives of many by risking their own. Who's willing to do that? Welcome to Nutty. These are the most dangerous jobs that were a necessity during the First World War. Even though radio made its debut just a couple of years before the Great War began, it was nowhere close during the war years to eliminate the need to physically relay the messages between units and beyond. That's why armies were dependent on using other modern technologies like the telegraph or the telephone, scouting methods such as color flags and reflecting sunlight, and traditional messengers such as pigeons and smoke signals and men riding horses to deliver the news. But the most trusted and dependable were still human runners, men who would travel large distances on foot to deliver the messages to their comrades in the same fashion the Incan Postal Service did. Sending men on foot had many advantages, like the ability to sneak around the prying eyes of the enemy, men being able to memorize the messages in case the actual paper gets intercepted, and they could survive better in hostile conditions than animals. The runners were mostly new recruits and low-ranking non-commissioned officers like corporals. These men were selected on the merit of having excellent stamina, agility, fitness, ability to read maps, and a knack for survival, kind of like Rambo with sneakers. Instead of a field pack and a rifle, these men were provided only a sidearm, a haversack, and a canteen. After 1916, as chemical warfare became more regular in warfare, they were also provided a gas mask along with a steel helmet to safeguard them against the sharpshooters. These men, by the way, had to run for miles to cover a small distance because of the zigzag nature of the trenches. I mean, a mile in these twisted and snaky trenches could only mean covered an actual distance of somewhere between six to 700 feet. The mud dragged the journey out longer and tested the endurance of all the men on the front. By 1917, the war front's landscapes had become moonlike due to the bombardment, except they were also filled with water because of the constant rain. Still, going out in the open land was pretty much a certain death. There were precise snipers and a barrage of machine gun fire searching for them, but the biggest threat, the mines. One wrong step could blow them into bits. Would you rather be blown to bits or blown to smithereens? Seems like smithereens would actually be more painful. Due to the unpredictable odds of the runners making their destination, most of the time unit commanders would send about three runners at once who would take different routes for the same job. Basically, they were hedging their bets hoping at least one of these men would make it to the end. One runner who turned this danger on its head was Canadian soldier Francis Pegamagabo. Despite the fact that Canada didn't accept indigenous citizens for enlistment during the First World War, Francis kept knocking on the door until he was accepted in 1914. Kind of like that salesman who won't go away even after you tell him, no, nah, I'm not interested. A natural born survivor, Francis was taught the ways of hunting and scouting by his foster father. He could sneak into no man's land under darkness and bury himself in dirt and debris. Then he would wait patiently until a German helmet filled his scope to land the precise shot and then vanish into the night. Francis courted death in three important battles of World War I. Apart from dodging artillery during his message runs and taking down enemies with his precise shots, Francis had a narrow escape from the attack of the yellow gas that took down most of his battalion in the Second Battle of Ypres. Though he survived, his lungs had some permanent damage. Now that aside, Francis relocated to the battlefield and continued delivering messages and lethal blows while scouting important information during the pivotal battle. Even though Francis was a sniper who was most likely supposed to eliminate his targets during the Battle of Mount Sorel, Francis was solely responsible for taking dozens of enemy soldiers as prisoners of war. In fact, over the course of the entire war, Francis arrested as many POWs as the number of fatalities that he delivered. 
During the Battle of Somme, a lucky enemy soldier managed to shoot Francis in the leg. Now, not only did Francis manage to escape the hairy situation, he dragged himself to the infirmary, but he also insisted on being redeployed to active duty right after recovery. A note in his medical chart reported that he had bleeding from his ears, plus more at that time, but was sent back into line the following day. Later in the war, Francis helped the Allies take the Passchendaele Ridge with his acute reconnaissance and eliminating crucial targets in the same manner he was doing before damaging his lungs and leg. Now on paper, sure this appeared like a redundancy thing, but without it, fail-safe disasters were prone to happen. In 1918, U.S. Sergeant Alexander McClintock was serving with Canadian troops in France as part of an assault when an officer chose to send only one runner to deliver the last-minute response to a change of strategy by the Germans. Unfortunately, the runner was hit, and as a result of that undelivered message, an entire battalion found itself without cover and Germans caused 600 deaths in less than 15 minutes. As a result, several officers got court-martialed to pay for this mistake. You know, a marching army has to function like a train in many ways, and the combat engineers were the men who had to lay the tracks down while sitting on the cowcatcher of a train engine. When the U.S. entered the Great War, men with all kinds of skills and talents were enlisted to serve their country, and certain soldiers with a particular set of skills became what is known as the combat engineer. Now, combat engineers were the vanguard of the vanguard. They were the creme de la creme. I mean, these guys were like the homies with the balonies. Okay, maybe take that part out. They had to walk right in front of the enemy lines to cut down barbed wires. Anyway, their job was to clear up the path for the advancing infantry. They had to walk right in front of the enemy lines to cut down barbed wires, install platoon bridges, and repair roads to ensure the mobility of heavy vehicles. In certain cases, they also had to locate minefields for the army to avoid. These men would carry a haversack with two days of rations, a gun, ammunition, a gas mask, a hatchet, and a pair of quarter-inch bolt cutters because German barbed wire was too strong for the regular pliers. A squad of engineers often had to work all night installing bridges while dodging the shots being fired from the enemy lines. Many times they would complete these tasks while lying down the whole time to avoid casualties. The combat engineers would often be tasked with digging up trenches as well. The First World War not only saw the dawn of air combat, but also submersible combat too. But submarine technology was more bare-bones during the Great War than aviation, and it remained a ghastly morbid affair even during the Second World War. Germany and the U.S. both had peaked at around 60 to 70 active-duty submarines during the First World War. The German U-boats were ghastly deadly with a 75% casualty rate. The SMU carried out the infamous sinking of the HMS Pathfinder on September 5, 1914, off the east coast of Scotland. Hit by a torpedo, the HMS Pathfinder became the first ship to be sunk in the Great War. Most of the crew had no chance to escape, although the explosion was within sight of land, Captain Martin Peake knew it was essential to attract attention, so he ordered a stern gun to be fired. But this must have been damaged by the explosion, because after firing a single round, the gun toppled off its mounting, rolled around the quarterdeck, and went overboard, taking the gun crew with it, and there was no time to lower the warship's lifeboats. Only five minutes after the impact, groaning and tearing noises from below signaled that the forward bulkheads had collapsed. Those who survived the explosion must have known that the HMS Pathfinder was doomed. Fishing boats from nearby Eyemouth were soon on the scene, but found nothing but debris, fuel oil, clothing, and a handful of survivors. Out of 268 passengers, 250 ended up dead. Another infamous attack was the sinking of Lusitania, where German U-boats caused the death of 128 Americans aboard a British ship that forced America to join the Allies and pivoted the war. Oh, y'all done started something now. On the other hand, the Allies didn't have as much success as Germany with submarines. For example, the K-class submarine was a British steam-powered submarine that challenged the known physics. But it wasn't exactly a technological marvel. The large size and high speed made it very, very hard to maneuver and the UK lost more submarines to accidents than being floored by the Germans. In the Battle of May Island, the K-class submarines crashed into each other. Two of them drowned and three got severely damaged, claiming 105 lives. Another disaster for British submarines was the Dardanelles campaign, where submarine E-15 grounded itself at Kefis Point. Six of the crew members lost their lives and others were taken as prisoners of war by the Ottomans. Today, most of the World War submarine wreckage can be found in the Irish Sea off the coast of Scotland. This is the location where the rumor of a sea creature taking down German boats emerged in the early days of the internet. But sadly, there is no record of any German captain telling tales of a monster that ate his U-boat. 
Obviously, there were not as many men going down into the depths, so the number of underwater fatalities that happened during the Great War was not a huge number in comparison to other terrains. But one water gig proved truly the stuff of unknown horrors where anything going awry could end a disaster. The men on these missions were known as the tent openers, and their job was to secure submarines from enemy interest after they were sunk deep down to the ocean bottom. Both Allied submarines and the German U-boats carried important documents and ciphers of war plans, cryptic orders, and cryptologic keys. That is why whenever a submarine was sunk, the highly prized race to retrieve the vessel's remnants began as these remains rapidly drifted down to the seafloor. The British Royal Navy recognized the urgency and employed teams of deep-sea divers to raid sunken German U-boats for their information treasures. The Navy was hoping that these men could salvage ciphers, codes, and keys to secret messages that could help the British to gain an upper hand. But diving with a very primitive technology was pretty risky. The diving suit was weighted down to about 90 kilograms, or nearly 200 pounds, mostly by distributing weights in the kit and making them wear lead-soled boots. It allowed them to move at the bottom of the ocean, but it was cumbersome and tedious and exhausting, especially given that these men had to operate in zero visibility while avoiding twisted sharp metal sheets and loosely hinged air vents. Once they got to the wreckage, the divers had to risk their safety by entering the wreck through the narrow hatch of the command tower, which usually was heavily deformed by the explosions it endured and could collapse on the divers. Also, there was always a risk of an explosive stuck in the structure that could go boom at any time. Another explosive hazard was the presence of submersible mines that could damage the eardrums and or rupture the internal organ to the divers even by exploding at a fair distance. These injuries also had a high risk of being fatal. Now, to get these divers to do that, they were offered an indemnity of 300 to 500 British pounds to next of kin if they wouldn't make it back, which in today's money is about 20,000 to 25,000 British pounds. There was a thing that the higher staff were fighting for, very reasonably, was to find out what Germans were opposite you in the line. Or were they perhaps more people being sent from the Russian front in order to get a complete picture? That was very reasonable. But in order to do that, they didn't come up themselves. And they were asking you to do the most stupid things. However, it was a whole different game than how casually it was ordered by the commanding officers. First, even though officers asked for volunteers, ultimately, the soldiers had no say regarding being picked, kind of like being drafted into the NFL. These people were grouped into small teams that were ordered to stealthily cross through no man's land, cut through barbed wires without raising any alarms, and creep up on the sentries in the night. If they were lucky and precise, taking down one sentry was enough to make their way inside the enemy trench, and then the mayhem would ensue. Sometimes the riflemen would go in and try not to be spotted as they bayoneted as many men as possible to isolate possible prisoners. Other times, while the bombarders tossed grenades to maximize casualties amidst the confusion and chaos, the riflemen tried to grab prisoners as quickly as possible, get out of there in smoke and dust, and pull them towards their own trenches in the dark of night. Apart from arms and ammunition, the trench raiders would also equip themselves with every manner of specialized tools like trench knives, daggers, and trench clubs. The clubs were short, cruel-looking head smashers that were designed to do silent but deadly work of incapacitating enemies. Most trench raiders would create them from the materials they found on the front lines. Another deadly tool of destruction used in fights by the soldiers were brass knuckles, affixed with serrated blades causing wounds that couldn't be sutured. These brass knuckles were banned at the Geneva Convention, but not really. The idea was to crawl through German wire, try and get underneath, and uh, jump into the, their front line trench, dispose of whoever was holding it by uh, banning it, if possible, without making any noise, or clubbing over the head with a butt. Now you drop into the trench once you've established yourself, and went your way round each bay. First of all, the rifleman would go, leading, and then he'd stop at the next bay, which, which was normally a park which was unoccupied, and uh, the bomb thrower would then throw a grenade towards the next bay of their line, or where he thought it would be, judging from the distance of the other one. Just after it exploded, the man who were leading, the rifleman, he dashed round the, into the trench where their bomb they had just gone off and disposed of any occupants that were left behind. And so he'd go on until we cleared the whole trench. 
Trench warfare required a lot of patience, endurance, and precision from the armies, and often risked complacency and boredom. The trench raids challenged this monotony and provided a sudden burst of adrenaline and emotions that also countered the objective of these raids, to be stealthy, accurate, quick, and untraceable. One mistake was enough to put the entire team in jeopardy and turn the tables on them. Instead of grabbing prisoners for intelligence, they would become the prisoners surrounded by guns in every direction. In that situation, a quick death would be the most merciful thing for them. If they were going to make a raid, they'd have to prepare for it, you see. They'd have to go out and be trained for it. They'd know exactly what you've got to do. The people who were going to make this raid would go out to a training area where the whole trench system would be taped out and they would know exactly what they got to do, where they got to go and where everything was. Well, some people before the raid would take place would go out and cut wire so they could get through. And some people might go out to lay a telephone so that the chap on the raid could telephone back. That sort of thing. They used to have listening posts too. Out from the front line, about 20 or 30 yards, would be a, a, a little trench with a chap in there and he would listen. He could hear in the dark, you know, and, and that sort of thing, you know. Often the cost of high casualties made the officers question the need for such risks. And despite that, these men knew the importance of conducting such dangerous missions and did so no matter how much they hated them. Aviation technology wasn't even anywhere close to the drinking age when the First World War broke out. Yet both sides were more than eager to employ this exciting but very unstable machinery during the war to gain the upper hand, no matter the cost. The concept of air superiority drove both sides to create faster, bigger, and more lethal flying, fighting, and bombing machines that nobody would have imagined before the Great War. Air balloons were already in use by many nations for nearly a century. They were employed for observing and reconnaissance, and that is what the early warplanes were also being developed for. These were two-seater aircraft planes operated by one pilot and had one passenger seat up front with binoculars that were later replaced by cameras for an observer to spy on enemies deep inside enemy lines. But it only took a few months before somebody realized you could stick guns to the front and sides of the planes and attach grenade dropping contraptions at the bottom, so aerial dogfights and bombarding enemy cities became normal in warfare. This put pilots in a more different combative role therefore putting their lives on the line in more than one way. I'm sure they were happy about that. While earlier reconnaissance pilots would wave at each other after the Battle of Marnes, they were asked to shoot each other on sight. So the pilots would thereafter carry pistols with them while flying to attack, until interpreter gear was invented that allowed strapping a front-mounted machine gun to the planes. So they were actually in the air with handguns shooting at each other. I mean, how accurate could that possibly be? But all of these innovations were like throwing mud at the wall and seeing what sticks. Aeronautics engineering was still more of a rich kid's hobby and had become a science. The 1915 Newport 17 monoplane was one of the earliest French planes that was used by French, British, Italian, and Belgian squadrons. It was, like most great war planes, constructed mostly of wood and was powered by a 110 horsepower Lerone rotary engine, which meant that somebody had to manually crank the front fan to make the plane go. Now, though the aircraft was agile and descended rapidly, it was basically a wood box held together by nails carrying a human life hundreds of feet up in the air, fighting both Mother Nature and anti-gravity. You can't forget the enemy. British Royal Air Force Cadet Frederick Barr Shaw was excited to tell his parents in a letter he sent in March of 1918 that he survived the crash that left his BE-2 plane smashed to bits. He only endured a few minor scratches, which according to him was an achievement because he had only trained for 12 hours. 12 hours of training and they put him in the air in a wood box. That's incredible. His journal also described that there were on average three crashes every day in the training area, and though most of the time trainees survived with minor cuts and bruises, the deaths of crashing cadets started piling up as weeks and months passed by, along with those who got seriously injured for life. In 1917, British manufacturers rolled out 14,000 aircraft for the military, which was a massive jump from 193 in 1914. The number is also about 27 times higher than the number of fixed-wing aircraft that are known to be in the Royal Air Force since 2023. The idea was to make sure they had enough planes no matter how many they will lose during training. These were such desperate times that often fighter planes were commissioned and deployed despite known hazardous flaws in them. Some planes were so precarious that they offered a very narrow margin of error that the RAF considered them filters to separate good pilots from pilots who were not so good. And it usually didn't end well for the pilots They were not as good. It never does. These planes could only fly two to three hours on a full tank, providing airborne technology that enabled the wet dreams of Army generals to attack core bases, hospitals, administration, and other important centers beyond enemy lines. 
but the pilots had to be really precise about how far they could venture in the air. They didn't have GPS, they didn't have any kind of technology like that, and they had to turn back towards the base. And they had to figure out when they were going to do that while in the air handling their business. No, not that business. And they had to do that while sitting in a plane that could also betray them at any moment. Their oxygen mask might malfunction, guns might jam in the middle of the dogfight, and the fuel tank might leak, or the engine would suddenly stop working, leaving them hanging in the air. Hanging being a relative word. The cockpits were also so small that there was no space for parachutes. I mean, there wasn't even room to think. One out of every five Royal Air Force pilots who saw combat died in either dogfights or accidents. The deaths and training were also slightly higher than that number. Pilots, by the way, had to rely on alcohol and dexedrine, modafinil, Colombian powder, and even tripping liquid to increase their endurance and stamina and reduce their stress. Survival was an arduous task in the air without any communication and solely relying on paper maps. When was the last time you went on a long trip using a paper map? Do they still have paper maps? Due to such a high mortality rate and the courage that was required to perform under high stress, newspapers in Europe gave these pilots the title of Flying Knights. Pilots like Albert Bell, William Bishop, Andrew Beauchamp, Max Emmelman, Edward McManick, James McCutton, and the Red Baron earned fame and respect from both sides for their amazing flying skills and combat prowess. But out of those eight, only one survived the Great War. Thanks for watching Nutty. If you had fun watching this video, do like and share the video and hit the subscribe button to watch more videos like this one in the future.